1 Chronicles 4, verses 22 and 23, when we read these two scriptural passages, we get to understand that there existed ceramic quarters in Jerusalem. The Bible tells us the family of Koziba, Joash, and Saraph were the porters who lived among the plants and the hedges. They lived there with the king for his work. These men started guilds of potters and royal pottery because the demand was great in the Orient. You see, beloved, copper vessels are very and were very expensive. Peasants could not afford those. Leather bottles are not suitable for some domestic purposes. And the readily available earthenware vessels are easily broken and must be repaired or replaced often. As a result of that, a potter's work was in great demand. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 6, King Solomon advising us to accept God before some tragedy happens, to submit our lives to him before we give up the ghosts, before we die, before our plans are terminated unexpectedly, he uses the imagery of a broken vessel to illustrate his point by saying before the pitcher be broken at the fountain. If a young woman going for water rests the pitcher down too suddenly, it can break it. If one intentionally dashes a vessel of clay to the ground, it will completely ruin the vessel. Dashing a potter's vessel on the ground is often used by the biblical writers to depict divine judgment on God's enemies or upon his disobedient people. In Psalm chapter 2 verse 9, the Bible says God will dash them to pieces as a potter's vessel. Jeremiah 19 11, God says I will break this people and the city as one breaks a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again. In Revelation 22 verse 27, the Bible says, He, that is Jesus, shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, they will be broken to pieces. Potters were in great demand in the Orient because vessels of clay were easily broken. And today, beloved, you and I are the vessels of clay. We are easily broken. As a result, we need a potter. Are you hearing me? Yes. Psalm 51 verse 5, the Bible says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, we're easily broken. Job 15 verse 16 says, Man is abominable and filthy, and he drinks iniquity like water easily broken. Romans chapter 3 23 says all have sinned, all have been broken and come short of the glory of God. We need the potter today church because we are easily broken. Isaiah 64 verse 8 tells us behold God you are our former, you are our father, you are the potter we are the clay and the work of your hands. We need the potter today, Norwood, because we are easily broken. In preparing the clay, the potter would trod it with his feet so that it might become of the right consistency. There's a process that the potter goes through, beloved, in preparing the vessel. And I want you to fasten your seatbelts with me as we go through this process. So he would trot it with his feet to make sure everything is smooth of the right consistency. 
David, after he had sinned with Bathsheba, beloved, in Psalm 51, verse 7, he asked God to perform the same operation in his life when he says, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. You see, wash here, beloved, kabas is the Hebrew. It means to wash by treading or stamping with the feet. This is what the Hebrews called deep boy washing. Heavy duty kind of washing. When they're washing some simple little clothes and fabric, they use their hands. But when the stain was hard, tough, difficult to get out, they spread it on the ground and they begin to stump it. After David was stained by adultery with Bathsheba, killing her husband, lying, defaming God's name and character, he says, Lord, I need you to treat me like a potter. Put me under your feet. Stump me up. My life right now is inconsistent. I need to be of the right consistency. Are you hearing me, church? I'm going somewhere. I'm just setting the foundation. Are you following me? Isaiah chapter 41, 25. Describing this process. The Bible says God will come upon princes as upon mortar and as the potter treads the clay we have been stained we need God to spread us out stump us up so that our lives can be consistent and the Bible says Jeremiah went down to the potter's house in verse 3 and he observed the potter making something on the wheels Jeremiah entered the potter's house church. He saw the potter sitting on a coarse wooden bench behind two large stones with an axle standing up from the center of the lower wheel. He observed the upper wheel turning horizontally when the lower one is put into action. He realized that there, there's a pile of clay lying on his bench. The potter would take a lump and the put it on the upper wheel and he would begin to spin the wheel and as the wheel spins beloved he he shapes the clan into a cone shaped figure he uses his left thumb to uh, make a hole in the top of the whirling clay and he he keeps opening it until he can put uh, his entire left hand uh, inside the vessel he is making as necessary he sprinkles the clay with some water from a vessel that's lying right beside him he uses a small piece of wood with his right hand to uh, smooth the outside of the vessel as it rotates uh, with dexterity with skill and uh, craftsmanship beloved the potter shapes the vessel uh, into whatever shape uh, he desires and the Bible says God sent Jeremiah to the potter's house to observe the way the potter works. So that through understanding how the potter works, he'll be able to understand how God works with his people. Are you hearing me, church? So as Jeremiah observed the potter, he's really understanding what God does in for and through and with his people god is the initial porter genesis chapter 2 verse 7 tells us that god formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being you see formed here yatsa is the hebrew beloved it means to put to mold into form to squeeze into shape god is the initial potter you and i did not come from some slime pit as the evolutionist will have us to believe god formed us into shape in Psalm 139 verse 14, David says, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, O Lord, and that my soul knows right well. God is our initial porter and God takes his time when he's making a vessel. 
As Jeremiah observed the part of work in beloved, the Bible says the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. You see, sometimes, beloved, some gravel, stones, pieces of wood are incorporated with the mass of clay and uh, would create a breach in the vessel, thus marring it. The potter would mash up the clay, remove the impurities, um, and make something different. Instead of throwing the vessel away, beloved, uh, he simply mash it up. Sit up, I'm ready to preach now. He would simply mash it up, start over, and make something different. Notice the Bible says uh, he made it into something else uh, that seemed appropriate to him. Many a times, beloved, we are messed up, we're broken, and many a times, people dash we away. Society don't want anything to do with us. Our families and friends give up on us. But God don't work the way people work. Instead of throwing us away, God simply starts over. He takes the same lump of clay. He takes the same vessel. He removes the impurities and he makes... I wonder if you're following me this morning. He makes something different. Now you and I ought to understand something from this beloved church. Many a times when God makes us into a vessel, we don't appreciate what he makes us and for what function he has made us. And so we look at each other. I am not this. I am not that. And so we grumble. Are you hearing me? We make noise. We scream. We're dissatisfied. But if you observe with me carefully, God did not have to make it into something different. When you became mad, he could have dashed your way like everybody else. Are you listening to me? But instead, he makes you into something different and he, put, he places you somewhere where he knows you can function properly. Somewhere where you will have use. Somewhere where you will be a blessing not only to yourself but to all who are around you. So if you are here in a position, if you are a different kind of vessel and you're not satisfied with what God has made you, I want you to dispel that thought and just be grateful that God never dash away but he made you into something different and he put yourself somewhere where he knows you can function effectively are you hearing me somebody thank god he never threw me away but just changed me into something else isaiah chapter 45 verse 9 says woe to him who fights with the one who formed him shall the clay say to its former what are you making all your work he has no hands in romans chapter 9 verses 20 and 21 the 20th new century new testament puts it this way i might rather ask who are you who are arguing with god does a thing which a man has molded say to him who has molded it what are you making or why did you make me like this has not the pot, the pot absolute power over his clay so that of the same lump he makes one to honor and one for common use? God can make you and I as the clay, the pot, the, the vessel into whatever he sees fit to make us. Whatever God has made you in his house, stop the grumbling and be satisfied. Are you hearing me, church? Too many times we don't enjoy where we are. Are you following me? We don't function effectively as we should. Because we are red. Mm -hmm. We're covetous. We're looking at this one and that one. 
what they have and what we, what we don't have. And where they are and where we are and we're not functioning properly. We're not functioning effectively. We're jealous of the kind of vessel God has made them. But you need to understand as a clay beloved, broken clay that is, God did not have to waste his time into making you something different. Are you hearing me? In his love and mercy, when you became mad, he makes you into something different and places you somewhere where he knows you can function effectively. Isaiah 43, 7. The Bible says, everyone that is called by my name, I have formed him for my glory. Wherever God has placed you, be satisfied. There's a reason he put you uh, where he put you. Uh, whatever kind of vessel he has made you to be, uh, remain there and be satisfied. David says in Psalm 84, 10, A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper, a greeter in the house of my God, than to dwell with the wicked and to divide the spoils. Whatever God makes me, I'm all right with it. If he has me to be just a deacon, to clean the floor, I'm all right with it. If God has put me to stand outside and to, to trim the grass and the trees, I'm all right with it. If I'm just a mere deaconess, I'm all right with it. Whatever God has made me in his house, as long as I'm connected to God's house and I'm among God's people. You're not hearing me this, this morning, man. As long as I'm connected with God and his work, I'm all right with it. Are you hearing me, church? I'd rather be a doorkeeper, David says, than to dwell in the palatial mansions of the wicked. Because if I'm standing there at the door, I come to church depressed. I know you have your issues. Some of you drag yourself to church this morning. Hello? Some of you did not feel like coming to church. Some of you had a hectic week. Some of you right now might have a difficulty listening to me because your stomach is talking louder than I'm preaching. Are you hearing me? Some of you have some serious challenges and issues you're facing. But even at the door, you come depressed. You must can hear a word that's going to encourage you. If you came feeling as if there's no reason to live, something about the service must be able to pump some life into you. Are you hearing me, somebody? You don't mind if church go on for the entire day because when you go home, you don't know what you and your picnic are going to I mean eat. But guess what? In God's house, Somebody must be able to feed you. You know, I hear me, church. You don't know how the bills are going to get, get paid. You don't know how you're going to send the kids to school. Somebody in God's house must have something extra. and can give you a holy handshake. You all know those handshakes? When some great church brother or sister come to you and they, 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 they shake your hand tightly. They squeeze it and when they left it, they, they leave some men there. Are you hearing me, somebody? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Whatever kind of vessel he has made me to be, I am not going to bad mine somebody else's position. I'm not going to fight and corrupt myself and to wish myself where he has not placed me. I will be satisfied right where I am. I'm just happy, church. He never dash me away. I'm just happy church. He never put me aside and move on to something else. But in his love and mercy, he makes me into something different. So he makes it into another vessel that seemed appropriate to the potter to make it. After the potter is finished with the vessels, beloved, he places them 
on a shelf where there are rows of other vessels. They are deliberately kept from the direct rays of the sun, but exposed to the wind from all directions. Wind is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Somehow God allows us to be exposed to the influences of the Holy Spirit from every direction. Have you ever tried to run from God yet? And everywhere you go, somehow his spirit is there. Somehow he finds you. So the potter puts them at a place where they're exposed to the wind from every direction. After they are sufficiently dried, the potter would take them to the brick kiln or a furnace to be baked. The brick kiln, beloved, is a shallow well of stone or brick about four feet deep, eight to ten feet in diameter, with a small brick oven at the base of it. The vessels are piled up over the oven up to 12 feet high and thickly covered with brushwood to keep the heat in and to prevent them from chilling suddenly. The potter would burn the fire until the, until the pottery is sufficiently hardened. If the brick kiln church is not strong or if the vessels are burned insufficiently, the products would become inferior. I'm deliberately taking my time today because I need you to understand there's hope for broken clay. After the potter puts them on the shelf where they are exposed to the wind from every direction, he takes them to the oven. He puts them in fire. Then I hear me, Elder. He puts them in fire. He covers them with brushwood to keep the heat in. Because he knows if they are in the fire insufficiently, they would get a sudden chill and would not have any use. You now hear me? He keeps them in the fire as long as as he needs to uh, so that they can be baked properly right. Nahum chapter 3 14 says to make strong uh, the brick kiln the fire the oven has to be made strong uh, and to blaze sufficiently vessels are baked in the fire to make them of good quality you see, when I analyze this situation here, beloved, the fire strengthens weak constitutions. It hardens the soft materials. It confirms shape, maintains definite form, and it burns off all impurities. Can I tell somebody, stay in the fire? Many a times we become worthless material. Many times we become worthless pottery because we jump out the fire too quickly. But God has us in fire. Not to destroy us, beloved, but so that our form can be strengthened. Our constitutions can be strengthened. Our materials can be hardened. Our form can be maintained. And all the impurities, they can be burned off so that we, we, we can become valuable material. Job 23.10 tells me, when he has tried me in the fire, I will come forth as gold. Stay in your fire. God has you there for a reason. Daniel chapter 12 verse 10 says many shall be purified and made white and tried that is refined in the fire. Zechariah 13 verse 9 says I will bring the third part of them through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. God has you in your fire for a reason. If you don't go through the fire you're worthless material. Many of you are in some fire. Your fire may be your home. Hello, somebody. But turn in there. The fire may be your spouse.
turn in the fire. The fire may be your children. People at your workplace. The fire may even be the country you're living in. But turn in the fire. You're not hearing me, somebody. Many of you are in some serious financial furnaces. But stay in there. You are in some emotional furnaces. Stay in your fire. The fire is not there to destroy you. The fire is there to make you stronger. If you read Daniel chapter 3, beloved. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was thrown in the fire. <laughs> then I hear me, sir. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was thrown in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar looked. And he saw four men in there instead of three. Jesus was right there with them in the fire. Not only that, but the Bible tells me, beloved, that uh, the hat, the turban they had on uh, was not burned. Their coats weren't burned. Uh, their sandals were still intact. Uh, not even their hair singed. Uh, not even the smell of smoke uh, God allowed to remain on them. Uh, the only thing that was burnt off. The church not hear me at all. The only thing that was burnt of these young men were the ropes that had them tied. Sometimes God got to dash some of we in a fire because we are tied by a lot of ropes. Our, our movement is inhibited. Our freedom is hindered. And God has to fling us in fire to burn it off. I want if somebody listening to me. As a vessel beloved, you have to go through the fire so that the impurities got to burn off. The robes gotta come off. Some of you are tied with malice. Some of you are tied with backbiting. Some of you are tied with fornication. The church now hear me. Some of you are tied with adultery. Some of you are tied with worldliness. But because you are good material, God no one dash away. He fling you in fire to burn off. He puts you in fire to burn off the ropes that have you tied. So stay in your fire. Many a times we are tied with some ungodly fashionable stuff. Hello? When I sleep on me, man. Can I keep a real church? Nowadays it's very difficult. To determine a Christian from a non-Christian. Non-Christian get their hair do a certain way and put in some colors. Christians do it too. They put on their spike heels and the fishnet stockings and some tight skirt and short stuff to uh, draw men and oh man too. Christians doing it too. Can I keep it real with you? Some non-Christian men, when they're looking for man, put their pants tight and uh, draw it down a certain way to expose uh, their undergarments. Christian men are doing it too. Can I keep it real with your church? Many a times our ministries are tied. The image of the church is tied. And God has to fling us in fire. Now, I'm not trying to disrespect anybody. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just keeping it real. Because if your Christianity don't demand of you to stand apart and to live the Christ-like life, give it up. Are you hearing me? We cannot marry the world and the church. They have to stand apart. Are you hearing me, somebody? Non-Christians are advertising for KFC. Breasts, legs, hips, and thighs. Christians are doing it too. Can I talk to your church? And some churches you go to, no mind shop, even in church, they want you to buy KFC. Sometimes preachers, when we up here and we see certain things that the congregation don't see, we got to preach looking just one way. Because if you ever look in certain direction, problems. You know, I hear me, church. Because when you look down certain places, red. 
pink, blue, green, sometimes nothing. And God got a fling you in fire to burn it off. You cannot march to Zion that way. As a vessel, he sees you as good material. Something that can bring honor and glory to his name. But he knows if he leaves you like that, you will not get anywhere. You will not serve any good use. So he fling you in a fire. Burn off the impurities. Whatever kind of fire you're in church, don't be too quick to jump out of it. Stay in your fire. If you are burnt insufficiently, you will get a sudden chill worthless. When you remain in the fire, you're strengthened. The impurities are burned off. And when God takes you out, you would become a vessel of honor. Are you hearing me, somebody? When one goes to a potter's shop or the house of a, of a peasant, broken fragments of clay abound everywhere. Large pieces are used to take up hot coals to light fires. They are also used as ladles or like cups to fill water jars at wells as well as to use to drink water. Isaiah chapter 30 verse 14 says, Sherd is to take fire from the oven and to take water from the well. So they have a use for the large pieces. The smaller pieces, beloved, can be incorporated into a new vessel to make a different vessel. Peasants could not afford parchments. They used fragments of pottery to scratch memoranda of business transactions. Many of these have been unearthed by archaeologists, beloved, and they are called ostraca. There's no such thing in a potter's house or the house of a peasant beloved as useless clay everything has use you see some of us beloved friends can be used to take coals of fire from god's altar to go light the lives of others god has used fire some of us can hold the cool waters of the holy spirit to quench somebody's spiritual thirst there's no such thing as worthless or useless material. The broken pieces of pottery have use. Some of us can be ostrakas. Are you hearing me? The love, word, sacrifice, and life of Christ can be etched on us for all to read. This is what Paul was thinking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 2 and 3 when he says, We are epistles of Christ known and read by all men. When they look on us, they should see the spiritual transactions, the salvific transactions etched all over us from head to toe. The way we dress, the way we live. And we can let somebody know there's hope for them. Are you hearing me, church? God has use for every broken fragment. And some of us are not so big to be used for these purposes. Some of us are small, insignificant. By ourselves, we don't serve much or any purpose for that matter. But like the potter does if we can be incorporated into other vessels we can create new vessels of honor some of you in the church feeling like uh, there's nothing for you to do you don't have any talent you don't have any gift all you need to do beloved is to hook up All you need to do uh, is to hook up uh, with the right person in church. And you can make or become uh, a new vessel of honor. Some of you might not have use by yourselves. Uh, but if you can hook up with the pastor. Hook up with some of the elders. Uh, maybe the evangelist. Uh, you will have use. Uh, some of you need to hook up uh, with the Bible worker. 
or the musicians hook up with the adult or youth choir you can create a new vessel of honor i'm not hearing your church some of you need to hook up with the ay leader the youth ministries director or somebody godly in the church and you can become a part of a new vessel of honor there's no such thing as useless broken fragments of clay god has use god has work for everybody and whatever you can serve gladly willingly offer yourselves to serve in that capacity the bible tells us in verses five and six then the word of the lord came to jeremiah saying o house of israel can't i do with you as this potter behold as the clay is in the hand of the potter talk to me israel as the clay is in the hand of the potter so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. In other words, God was saying to his people, there's hope for broken clay. It don't matter how broken you are, how messed up you may feel, or how messed up others may make you feel. There's hope today, Norwood, for broken clay there's hope for broken marriages there's hope for broken homes there's hope today church for broken relationships there's hope for broken men women and children not only in society but even in the church there's hope today for broken clay there's hope for broken young people Many times we look at some young folk who don't come from the right home. They don't come from the right community. They did not go to that specific institution of learning. So we put them on a the back burner. Nothing good can come of that one. Walkless. Dirty boy. Can I keep it real? I'm just trying to keep it real. We are in Jamaica, right? And you understand these terminologies, right? And we call them all sorts of work, workless and nasty names. And uh, we ensure grind them to the mud. No hope for you. But when God gets a hold of those people. I wonder if I could testify to somebody. You see, a few years ago, I was one of those young men whose society looked at broken. Now I come to nothing. You see, I did not have a father in my life. He died when I was very small. Born in Haiti. And if you saw how I looked then and the way I look now, you can't believe, say, I'm me. Can I keep it real with somebody? You see the kind of children you watch on TV? In Africa and Somalia and them something there? I saw me didn't look. Small pencil neck. Football head. Ballooned belly. Little fine broom thick foot. Can I keep a real with somebody? Walking around, around naked. In Haiti, no hope, no future, nothing. Mother was in the Bahamas with the rest of my siblings. At the age of nine, she came and got me. I was nine years old. And when we went through the immigration, they had us locked up for an entire day. Thought she was smuggling me. I looked like I was two. Could not believe I was her child. Are you hearing me? And after they called immigration from Nassau to Freeport where she resided and they legitimized that I was her child, they let us through. And in about three to six months, me, six months, me fought up like calf. Are you hearing me? Went to school. Started watching everything on TV so in no time I could speak English fluently. Hear me somebody. Watching all kind of ungodly stuff because uh, our home was not a Christian one. So Tupac and Biggie, Cash Money, Lil Wayne, 50 cents and I can name all of them. Uh, I dim their lifestyle me I come from. It's those kind of people I grew up with. 
12, 13 years old, I would sneak out the house uh, with the big boys to go to Capleton and TOK concerts. Ghost, elephant man, and clubbing all night. That's the kind of brother see I had. Got kicked out of every government school on Grand Bahama. Luckily, at the age of 18, they let me in one, promising that I would behave myself. Started piercing my ears, smoking dope, drinking alcohol, doing it bad, living my life, getting in trouble. And people look at you just a corner boy, street boy. Nothing good can come out of you. And besides, you're not a behemoth, you're just a little insignificant Haitian. And at the age of 19, coming out of high school, I came in the church. What if I could encourage somebody today? There's hope for broken young people. I came in the church and became very active in church. And even some church folk marginalized me. Are you listening to me? Your grandma and grandpapa never helped build the church. You ain't got no kind of family ties in the church. So people treat you a certain way. But thank God, there's always one or two good folk in the church. <laughs> Me no business how bad the church want time. I don't care how much people can call us hypocrites. And people can say no good people not there in the church. Listen to me somebody. I'm a product of it. God still has some good, decent, fine, benevolent, godly people in the church. Who will look out for a little man like me and a little woman like you. Can I get an amen for a good people church? When they saw I was active, they started to sing on the youth choir, traveling all over the place, orphanages, old folks' home, hospital, singing with the youth choir. During Bible bo doing Bible bowl competitions in church, and doing whatever I'm asked. One year later, at the age of 20, we were invited to come to NCU to do a concert. And they brought me over. Are you hearing me? They brought me and their children and the rest of the choir. And when they were leaving the following week, unbeknownst to me, they left me at NCU for study. Can I talk to somebody? I did not have any BGCSEs, that's what we call them in the Bahamas. Equivalent of CXT. Did those in pre-college. In a few months, I got them. Matriculate the following year. Did a full semester. The second semester, I got expelled. Life done. Life was over. I was dating my beloved wife. So for a year and a half, we were dating. Went back to the Bahamas. The situation happened so that the individual who got me expelled... Because he knew I'm not a Bahamian, he called immigration and had my little Haitian self deported back to Haiti. I'm 20 years old, left Haiti when I was nine, I don't know nothing about Haiti. All my education, all of my family are Bahamian, everybody is Bahamas. Are you following me? Called her, let her know what was happening. She cleaned out her bank account, sent my plane ticket to go back to Bahamas. Went back there two months later, filed for my work permit. That was the night. The government told my mom and my sister, if I want to live and stay in the Bahamas, I would have to get married to a Bahamian girl and to tan there. And they were making preparations to do that. But when I thought about that, that was not the best move for Thunder at that time. Because my wife and I had been dating over two years now and engaged for over six months. I couldn't do that. When I was back there at NCU, that good Jamaican woman hooked me. Hello? And she never hooked me with no sex. Can I keep it real with you? Because some of you feel like when you're dating, you got to engage in all these illicit activities before you get married. She never hooked me with sex. 
fine character and personality, godly demeanor, and some good dumpling hockey and saltfish. You know, I hear me. So I, I, I talked with her and explained to her the situation. If I am to get married to Behem in Tandir, it may take five to ten years to get citizenship, divorce that woman, then come get married to her. That couldn't work because I would lose her. So I told my family to go left Bahamas, you know. Now you got to understand, beloved, relocating to a new country and not nothing easy. New people, new language, new culture, new way of life, new everything. All of my immediate family are in the Bahamas. And I'm coming here to Jamaica. Now we got a bad mentality of Jamaica. We feel like as you tap out the plane, you're shot dead. <laughs> Seriously, that's the mentality. We don't hear about all these good stuff that are happening. It's just the bass of that are broadcasted uh, and on, on the um, media as well as the music. It's that kind of thing we think about. So the all are afraid of owner like puss. But I told them, I feel like this is the right move God wants me to make. So I came here, starting all over. Her parents embraced me. Now no job, no money, nothing. Them feed me. They give me their daughter to marry. Buy clothes, put on me back. There's good people in the church. Are you listening to me? They help us pay the rent for years. And in 2011, I tried going back to NCU to go on a work study program, but that would not, was not working. So I had to drop out again. Went back to my church in Dumfries and uh, just started to get active. Uh, a youth, they came and they asked my wife to preach. So she told them to let me preach. Now you got to understand, I would come to church and sit down like I can't hurt fly. <sighs> so they were timid. And when they let me preach, and God began to use me. That was the beginning of better things to come. Are you listening to me? A lady was there, Sister Joy Nemhard, a retired teacher. She pulled me aside and spoke to me. Notice you got a lot of talent. How is it going to go work with school? Man, I ain't got no money. I ain't got no job. What do you mean? I, I, I just got to do what I got to do here. She said, no, man, we got to do something about that. She had a good friend who was the wife of the personal ministries director. This was 2012. Pastor Donovan Williams. So she called her, got his number, spoke to him about me, set up a meeting for us. June 1st, 2012. Went in and spoke with him. Now, he never met me in his life. It's like I just dropped out the sky in West Jamaica. Listen to me, poured my heart, my intentions. Tell me, all right, I can see you're passionate about the ministry and God can use you. Tell you what, before you become a full bloom evangelist in the conference, you have to be known to the churches first. There's some experiences you have to gain. So I said, all right. The next day, Sabbath, June 2nd, 2012, he called Pastor Brevet. To appoint me to one of his churches, Tucker SDA. Pastor Brevet was weary at first. He did not know what to do, but he just went on his word. Are you hearing me? Yes. Pastor Brevet did not sit down to hear me preach. But after I preached in Tucker, as church done, the elders and the members call him. Pastor, this is a young man here, fiery. Him can preach, Pastor. So Brevet called me and sent me to Granville the following week. Three weeks later, Erwin, one of his churches, was having a crusade. And he tell them, at this young man here, me want to do it. They let me do that too. And from then, they just start go wrong like wildfire. Are you hearing me, church? God opened doors. When one closer, now I'm still dropped out of school, still can't go back and see you, still not have no money, got two picnic I can't mine, and a plump wife I can't take care of, but I'm being faithful to the Lord. 
Are you hearing me, church? Testimony still not done. There's hope today for broken young people like myself. Eight months later, we have time and Ori on herself. I was at Hopewell doing a crusade for Pastor Harvey. Before that, I was doing a week in Adelphi, one of my churches. And a lady was there from the Cayman Islands. And she just dropped there. She don't know why she attended that church that Sabbath. But she just came there, not knowing why. But God had bigger plans than she did. Are you hearing me, church? So when she saw me walk up, couldn't afford jacket suit then, so I ain't on no jacket suit. Just a simple washed out shirt and tie. But I wasn't worried about that. <laughs> wasn't worried about that. So when she saw me walking up now, she is testified to me afterwards. She got angry. Because she said, they might have picked me a preacher now. This little boy, they might have a preach. What would them can do? But she said, boy, when you stood up to speak, and God start to use you, have mercy. I could not stay in my seat. And when church was over, we greeted at the door. She took all my information and shared interest that they wanted me to come to the Cayman Islands. Now, I did not take her serious. I did not even know a place like that existed. But I gave her all the info anyhow. While I was at Hopewell doing the crusade, she called me. They are having a weekend deacon and deaconesses meeting. And then why me to do it? So she sent all the funds, do police record, to do all that I got to do, follow the immigration form, send it over. Instead of going there on the exact date, I went about three days earlier. Went there, met the pastor, I went the Monday. Sunday night, he allowed me to preach in one of his other churches. God is so awesome. He allowed me that Sunday night to preach in one of his other churches. And from that church, had me, hear me, them can catch a fire. Did the deacons weekend, I should have come home the Monday. The other church was supposed to have a two-week campaign coming up in a week and a half time. The evangelist was already there. But when they heard me, immediate board meeting. Pastor, I should be doing, doing the meeting. But this young man here got a whole heap of something behind and make him do it. So three days turned to two and a half weeks. While I was there doing that meeting, somebody from a different church came and heard me. Them want me at them church too. So them filed for me to come there and do two weeks too. Four days turned to a month. When I start complaining, me can start burning me, me a young man. And me miss me little schnugums. Until they give me heart attack. They brought her over. Are you hearing me? <laughs> I did not have any clothes. Then bought me suit. Then bought me shirt. Then bought me shoes. Then bought me socks. Then bought me underwear. You name it. And while doing that meeting at that other church, somebody else hear me too. And them called me to a different church. So four days turned to two months. Pastor O'Connor, the president, had heard me. Startled by the way God used me. Said, man, we won't keep you down here. But there's one small problem. You're not done NCU yet. So you know what? Since we can't keep you now, we're going to send you back to school. Can I encourage somebody? There's hope for broken clear. That's why I'm back up at NCU. And they're paying off all my tuition. Are you listening to me? And when school done, them no are nothing back from me. Are you hearing me, church? Because they see God using me, they want to help me advance my ministry. So young people, people may marginalize you. 
Look at your current condition and try to tell what your future will be. They don't know that. Don't let nobody write you off. God has a plan for you. God has a future for you. And he will put the right people in your life so that that can be materialized. There's hope that a church for broken clay. And it's been over a year and a half now. I've been back then. God has been good. He's blessing me with the grades. I forgot this young brother's name, but it's a good friend of mine in one of our, one of our classes. We did a class together. So as I saw him, I recognized him, but forgot the name. All they say I got to do, keep up the grades. And let God lead you through. Let him continue to use you. Humble yourself and go on his errand. People may look at you. Look at where you're from. Can anything good come out of Haiti? That their place there? Look for me good. Look for me good church. Something good can come out of Haiti when God has his hand on it. Can anything good come out of Jamaica? Look for one yourself. You're not here, my church. Look for yourself. Something good can come from yard. Can anything good come from Norwood? When I look at him and this brother here who sings so lovely and Stevie Gallimore and many of you that I don't fully know yet, I can say yes, there's hope for broken clay. If God has his hand in your life. You know what? Y'all making me feel like preaching. Let me sit down. Church, there's hope for broken churches. There's hope for your broken hearts and dreams. There's hope for broken futures. There's hope for broken sexualities. Yes, the homosexual, the lesbian, the zoophile. There's hope for them. There's hope for broken communities and cities. There's hope for broken countries. There's hope today, church, for our broken world. There is hope for broken clay. The songwriter says, there is not one broken vessel that God cannot mend. It don't matter how broken you are, how messed up you are. There's not one broken vessel. I want you to look by me good. I had a messed up childhood and teenage brought up sea. But there's one, not one broken vessel that God cannot mend. As I take my seat, beloved, I hope you all don't let me have to make an altar call. But if you're impressed, please find your way to the altar. Potters possess what I call, beloved, macrothymic longanimity which means they have consistent tenacious indefatigable patience simply but no matter how many times the vessel is messed up as they're working on it the potter would patiently sit down right there all day if he have to and he's still working on the vessel you're not listening to me. Babes, can you sing a song for us? Missy Potters possess an inexplicable patience. No matter how many times the clay messes up as he works on it, the potter would sit down right there and he will work on it. Many a times, beloved friends, you, my brothers and sisters, young man, young woman, all the ones in the church, as you walk with God, you are broken along the way. And sometimes you are broken so much. You falter so many times. You feel so bad with and about yourselves. People make you feel so valueless. People pump some negativity into you. Sometimes you feel like the only thing left to do 
is to leave the church give up on God stop trying stop fighting but I want you to understand today our heavenly father the potter God is very patient no matter how many times you mess up no matter how many times you fall how many mistakes you make how many impurities there may exist in your life him now go dash your way he's gonna work on you and work on you empty and work on you and broke until I came until back he makes you, you into the right vessel, vessel that he so sees you can be and so, so just before we pray whether you're in the church or not but he did not today you're a broken vessel he started and you want God to keep you in his hand and to I work on you I invite you, church. He didn't throw I invite you to the altar. You may be in the church, but not yet in the church. And over but you're broken. He Press closer. There's room at the altar. And, makes me and you want God today. To his line as the patient divine potter he is the to continue to fashion to mold to continue to I work on you today come to the altar leave your seats Jesus didn't throw the potter the clay work on you today now he is the potter anyone else out there and I am come to the aisle wherever you have to take that step of faith molded in God's take that step of faith and allow the divine potter to, stay. to work on you Stumble and to make you and I fall into that kind of vessel, vessel he way. wants you to be. My Lord just picked up those pieces. Let's sing it together, he church. Never throw the clay Let's sing it together. Away. Over and over. Over. He molds me. Over. He molds you. Molds me and he's making me and makes he's making me you into, into his, his likeness. likeness. He fashioned. I don't care what the, the situation is. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. I am today, and it's all. Because Jesus didn't throw the clay away over and over, he molds me and makes me into his likeness. He fashions the clay vessel of honor. I am today, and it's all because Jesus didn't throw the clay away and it's all because Jesus he didn't throw